Hi, my name is Rick Lawrence. I'm executive director of an organization called Vibrant Faith. I'm an author and general editor of the Jesus-Centered Bible, and I'm co-author of The Suicide Solution. Hello, my name is Dr. Daniel Amina. I'm a general psychiatrist and a child and adolescent psychiatrist, trained over UCLA and one of the associate medical directors here at the Amen Clinics. And I'm also co-author of The Suicide Solution. So I was telling Daniel uh, this morning I was in a hotel and I went down for breakfast and we were in a crowded uh, public area and I wanted to read through some of the book before we <laughs> sat down to do this. But I just instinctively did this when I put the book down on the table. I turned it over because I was concerned that somebody would just walk by and see I was reading a book about suicide. suicide. Yeah. <laughs> Talk a little bit about that. What yeah. was, you know, that, that's a, like a common default setting. I didn't even have to think about it, that I just was aware. Yeah. And you've seen a lot, of, you've thought a lot about this as well in, yeah. in, in the way that you, in your clinical practice. No, I mean, it's, it's pretty much why we wrote this book. Um, there is so much stigma on this particular topic that it makes sense. I think if I, I probably would have done the same thing too. I was like, I wouldn't want to give someone the wrong impression that something was going on with me. But unfortunately, because of that, it means that people don't talk about this and people don't feel comfortable talking about this. And particularly in, in, in areas of faith, people in church communities or such really barely ever bring this up until maybe something happens. Then yeah. If something happens, then there's some reactionary related stuff related to that event, and then it kind of fades off again. And again, it's usually focused on that particular one word, avoid that one word, avoid that suicide, but no one thinks about the underlying mechanisms before that. No one thinks about mental health. No one wants to talk about that. No one wants to talk about the brain health element because of that stigma. The same reason we have to yep. do this. You know, it's interesting what you just said too, that uh, I, I, I saw this dynamic uh, as it, it was really the germ of the idea in the first place for, uh, as far as my role in this that that pre-conversation about suicide wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. The only conversations I heard were after the fact, yeah. and they were the same conversation every time. Yeah. And it left me feeling hollow about the, the ways that people approach this epidemic um, that are only in retrospect. Yeah. They're only, what do we do now that this happened? Yeah. And nothing about, could this at all be prevented and not only could it be prevented, is somehow our faith life and the way that Jesus interacted with people, does that also play a factor in what could happen in a solution yeah. to this? Yeah, yeah. No, no, great, great points. And it's, you know, one of the reasons I'm, I'm thankful to have had an opportunity to, to, to work on this with you, because that solution word is an important one. Um, one of the things when I work with a client is I'm always focused initially on creating hope. Hmm. Then the next phase of that is empowerment, right? Hope and empowerment. You're part of the solution when we create whatever treatment plan it may be. So this book is about hope. Um, empowerment are the steps that are detailed in this book. And often, again, it's not usually talked about. It's talked about more in the well, let's make sure this doesn't happen again kind of situation as a reactionary thing versus a proactive step that, hey, even if you're not thinking about this topic, this concern, is there a way to live that bolsters you, that helps you be healthier in the first place, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, to be more resilient to this? Yeah. This is why I'm so happy that we're, we're having this conversation. Yeah, I, I want to get into the kind of the, the the basic structure of what we're trying to do here in the book. But yeah. one last thing about the title: uh, so suicide, there couldn't be anything more vulnerable than that yeah. as a topic. Yeah. Solution is a charged word. Yeah. You just talked about uh, a, a map of proactivity, really. Yeah. And I, when I think about that, I think, well, God does not force any of his solutions on us. Yeah. It's all invitational, yeah. which means he uh, has respect and, and dignity around our agency. He is always inviting us to participate with him. He's never forcing things on us because then a, a, a love relationship wouldn't be possible. Exactly. So by definition, solution implies agency 
and that there's things that we partner with with him. But that is a that is a charged word in and of itself, solution. Could you say a little bit more about what your heart is for solution around this? It's intentionality. Hmm. That's really what it comes down to. It says solution, but there's an intention. There's an intention, there's a way to live by that reduces your risks, that proactively protects your what we call here at the Amen Clinic is your brain health, but in other words, speak, your mental health. Um, that's what we're hoping for. There's an intention to this that leads to the solution, but you have to choose to live out that solution. In the book, we talk about this concept of you don't get out of valley of the shadow of, of death by clicking your heels, <laughs> right? There's a hike process to it. You find a guide and then you get hiking. And it will be challenging at times. And we don't want to pretend that there will be no challenge, but there is a path. And that's the biggest point that we want to communicate in this book. There is a path out of that valley. And people struggling with suicidality, the, the, the tension point, uh, and even the gateway to the slide further down really is all about hope. Correct. And I think when you talk about intentionality, I translate that to hope. Exactly. So what then does that hope look like? It's a bit of a catch-22 because when you say it's a hike with a guide to people who feel like they've got no energy or agency left in them mm -hmm. because of the place that they're in, mm -hmm. it's a double-edged sword message. And that's why I think it's great for us. Let's dive into talking about kind of the structure of what we're trying to, to do here with this menu of hope Excellent. that's in the book. So the, the book starts out with a, with a, a metaphor of hardware and software, the, how a computer works um, to do its job. And it, it means that the hardware has to function correctly and the software has to function correctly for it to operate efficiently. And depression, anxiety, and suicidality is a computer that's got a, a, maybe a bug in the software and a problem with the hardware. And, and it then le can lead to a, a kind of a complete shutdown um, if those things aren't addressed. So talk a little bit about the hardware software framework as it, as it pertains to a human being. You know, when I'm working with a client, we have to communicate very um, scientific uh, components and concerns and help them understand how their brain and their body works but I found that often it's best to not use those scientific words that I naturally want to gravitate to, but use uh, analogies and metaphors. Um, this metaphor actually works really well for a lot of my clients now because we are used to computers. We all have computers everywhere. We even have computers in our pockets. Our, our little uh, smartphones are more powerful than the computers we used five years ago. Um, there's a hardware element to it. There's a software element element to it. We know if we drop our phone, it impacts potentially how we interface with our phone, right? If you crack the screen up or something else happens or there's a battery issue, it's running out quickly, it'll impact what you can do with your phone. The software side is the same thing. It's one of the reasons why we always have to update our software on our phone, right? There could be a bug, there could be an issue, the phone's crashing. And it could be for different reasons that all of a sudden you're not able to achieve what you want to achieve with your phone. Even with knowing this, we don't necessarily think that this here, it works like that in many ways. Hmm. That there's a, there's a biological or hardware element to our function, and then there's a software element to our function. That's our psychology, our experiences, our, our, what we've learned, how we've interpreted them, our bad habits. How that what people have told us about ourselves that creates that psycho psychology that creates that software that also can contribute to when we have symptoms. Yeah, and the, and the, what's fascinating is you and I have uh, worked together through um, these various trajectories coming into here. The biology or hardware part of this, I think, a lot of people think, well, that's set. Mm -hmm. And that's not true. Uh, the, the, our biology is impacted by, and you've listed, I, I know we've talked through all of the different factors that, get, that can affect our biology, some of which can be very profoundly impacted and mm -hmm. changed. So it's not set, that part of it, even though sometimes we think it is. 
And then the software part of that, in, our, in the book, we, we refer to the software part as our story, our self-narrative, that we are narrative people and that the stories we believe about ourselves, we live into those stories. Exactly. And this is where the, uh, the, the tension really exists around our story, the story we're telling ourselves. And this is where uh, we get into the territory, I think, of where Jesus was constantly engaging people's self-narrative, their story. And also, it turns out, he's engaging their biology. I love this story of when uh, a paralytic man it, uh, is brought to Jesus, and he obviously wants a biological intervention mm -hmm. in his life. He's paralyzed. He wants Jesus to heal his paralysis. Mm -hmm. There's Pharisees standing around uh, watching what's going to happen, and it's on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So there's all kinds of charged stuff happening. The paralytic wants his biological rescue, and Jesus first says to him, though, a software thing. Mm -hmm. He says, my son, your sins are forgiven. Yeah. And he knows that's going to infuriate the Pharisees when yeah. he says that. And the man hasn't even asked for forgiveness for his sins. Yeah. But Jesus first says, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees get upset. Jesus says, well, it's just as easy to say that as to rise up, pick up your mat and walk. So rise up, pick up your mat and walk. So... Right there, for me, it's he's 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 centrally communicating hardware and software at the same time. Yeah. He's saying to the man, "You have two issues going on here, yeah. not just your biology. You have something else in your software that needs to be addressed too." Yeah. So Jesus holistically approaches the man that way, and everyone around him doesn't understand what he just did. Yeah. But that's really what you're tr what we're trying to say in this book is that. That merger of those two things is what uh, leads to what we call brain health. Exactly. I mean, as a clinician, when I meet with a client, I have to assess both situations. I have to assess what's going on biologically for them. And it's actually why at the Amen Clinics we do neuroimaging, right? So actually look at the organ we treat. And then on the other side, I also have to assess how their, st their story, their narrative, right? Um, or their psychology how they think about their situation, their hopes, their goals even in relation to treatment, their expectations, right? Um, I found that doing this work that even if we get the biology right, we, we come up with the perfect treatment plan in relation to that person's biology and their hardware, if their psychology is not on board, they don't get the outcome they want. Like it's, it's, it's so important to me now that at times I will spend more times in our first couple of sessions just focusing on that psychological piece than even really worrying about the, the built-up plan that I may have for them as far as the, the biology biological interventions. No matter even if they're important, if they're not on board, they're not going to get the benefit out of biological intervention that they, they need. Right? So it becomes extremely important to target both, to work on both. But unfortunately, that's not what we've been taught hmm. for the most part out there. Right? We've been taught that, frankly, we don't always even think about the hardware element of it. Yep. Right? We don't normally think about the biology element of it. It's, we call it being lazy. We call it you just got to buck up and strengthen up. You, we call it whatever terms to say, you know, that person's being weak. That's why all, they're having all, those symptoms. All pejorative terms. Exactly. All of them, uh, even when it concerns biology that is off, yes. it is processed as either a moral failure yes. or a strength failure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And it's not the same thing that happens if someone, you know, God forbid, has cancer, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Even yeah. though that's clearly a biological thing. And I think it really comes down to, for the most part, for most other conditions, there's an imaging thing. There's like a model, a picture. That's the thing that's going on, and they have to go in there and cut it out. People get it, right? Even though we all have brains and we all have brains that can sometimes malfunction, we've never seen it as such. We see it as this nebulous thing that potentially re relates to who you are, your value, your self-worth, separate from, hey, your biology might actually impact why you feel that way. And then not only is it about trying harder, being more faithful, reading more, praying more, whatever it is, it may also include helping that hardware heal. Yeah, it, let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, in the book, what we call uh, destructive narratives. Uh, yep. These are, 
Uh, in the, par- the Jesus told the parable of the wheat in the weeds. Yep. Uh, uh, there's a field and a farmer, and the farmer's planted wheat, but his workers come and say, hey, a, an enemy came in at night and planted a bunch of weeds amongst the wheat. What should we do? Should we pull the weeds out? And the farmer says, no, don't, don't pull the weeds out. You'll ruin the wheat mm-hmm. if you do that. Wait for a while, and at the right time, I'll harvest the wheat and we'll take care of the weeds. And and I think in the church, we have seen this parables uh, in a kind of a very simplistic way that the wheat is the good people and the, the weeds are the bad people. And at the end of time, Jesus is going to separate those and, and the good people get to be harvested and the, the, the weeds get burned up. Mm-hmm. But I think what that parable really is about is a picture of what our life is like, Mm -hmm. that we have good things growing up along with weeds growing up in the midst of that weed. Exactly. And they're intertwined. And if you just try to yank the weeds out, something happens to the... There's something that the wheat is strengthened by in the presence of those weeds. But those destructive narratives are like those weeds that are intertwined within our self-narrative. And they can choke off the life of the wheat potentially yeah. if they're if they're if there's unrestrained growth of those weeds it in the end can choke out the life of that wheat so the these weeds that are woven into our narrative somehow have to first be seen to mm-hmm. be weeds mm-hmm. and then there has to be a plan uh, an intentionality about what happens with those weeds in in uh, partnership with what God's trying to do in our life so when you think about the role of story and self-narrative and these sort of uh, what, what in the book we call contamination stories that, that get, uh, you know, uh, embedded in our story, yep. how, do, how do you see that showing up when, you're, when you have somebody sitting across from you? Mm-hmm. What are you thinking as they're telling their story and you see both wheat and weeds? So, so great question, great question. Obviously, you know, I've, I've communicated that our clinic has this mindset of let's look at the hardware, right? And, and that's really still a, a strong, one of the strongest messages I want to get through, right? There can be biological hardware related issues for why you feel the way you, need, you feel, and those also need to be addressed. But I also want to emphasize this point related to those destructive narratives. So we all tell a story to ourselves, and we can become that story. That is story is influenced by those around us, what we learned, what we grew up in, our experiences, what people told us about ourselves. What our trauma is telling us. What our traumas tell us. And unfortunately, those stories can become part of our core code. Like just straight up down deep in there as part of our core code, how we process and understand how we look at our world. Um, In psychological terms, there would be uh, another term called schema. It helps, um, it, it's, it helps us understand and process and interpret what is happening around us, right? There can be adaptive ones, there can be maladaptive ones. The maladaptive don't lead to benefit. Those are these destructive narratives we're talking about. Um, one of the things I actually like about the book, we list uh, some schemas. Uh, we actually list uh, 18, um, and there are more. Um, but there are things you've heard of. There's elements there of... Um, that most of us deal with on a day-to-day basis, right? I mean, a, a common one is just that element of not feeling good enough, like being uh, at your core faulty, right? If someone has that at their core of their code, it influences all the decisions and everything else that comes after. It influences how they interpret criticism. They might become very hypersensitive to criticism, right? Because they're already concerned about their code that is telling them you're inherently flawed. And here is another element of attack, proving that you're flawed. Right? And, and you can see, even when you say that, that one schema yeah. about I'm fundamentally flawed, where does it come from? You just track back the, in the person's story yeah. and you can discover where, where that weed yeah. was planted or that contamination story was planted in their story that ma- that helped them to make sense of their reality at the time, yes. right? And I think uh, I, I have a friend who, who I'm, a, I'm a longtime ministry leader, and I have a friend who told me last week, ministry leaders, our job is sense makers. Yep. And I said, what do you mean by that? And she said, it means that our part of our job is to help make sense of the, st- of the story of the person in yes. front of us. And the, the gospel story, 
story of Jesus and what he's come to do and bring, bring us back into wholeness is a meta narrative mm -hmm. that he wants to speak over in our life. Mm -hmm. um, but we have other narratives that are competing with that one. And our job is to help people make sense of their life in such a way that that meta narrative mm -hmm. is fully embraced yeah. and sort of overshadows. But the, the sense making part of this is a, is a challenge. I mean, is, when, you're, when you're in dialogue with someone, do you see yourself as a sense maker of, of some kind in, over and around their story? Oh, extremely. It's literally why they seek us out. Um, <laughs> they, they need to understand why they're feeling this way. Um, why they have been feeling this way. I mean, if, if anything gives people hope, sometimes it's that explanation initially. Right? We might, I might spend most of my time just explaining why they felt the way they felt, which then leads to a term called validation. They feel like, oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Um, that in itself is, is foundational to anything else I can say after that. Again, I can have the perfect plan but if I haven't helped them make the connections, they miss out on why they need to do the plan, right? So yes, that sense-making element is extremely important and it's making those connections. Now the challenge is, as you already said, it's a challenge. It's not, all, I mean, we are humans too, so there's elements with roads that we can go down. And some people have been through so much that they don't come in, in with one schema, they come in with multiple. And not only that, the brain after a while recognizes that these schemas have their benefit in some ways. They've protect, protected them in some ways. Um, they had their initial use and utility when they were first established, but over time it starts to cause pain and cause issues. So another one is, let's say, mistrust, right? So let's say you grew up in a home where you were neglected, you, you grew up in a home where you were abandoned, where you were harmed, where you were hurt, um, you might go, rightfully so, the world is not safe, let me not trust people, let me put this boundary around myself. And it probably kept you less disappointed, right? When the, the people around you did not meet the standards that you would have hoped for. You put a barrier, it kind of protected you. Now you move on into the world, but you're still car carrying this as your core code. How does that impact every subsequent relationship? it drastically impacts it. You're not having the level of intimacy and connection in those relationships. You're always and ready to look for the failing in the relationship. So even though you might have evidence against it, you are more willing to generalize the time that the other person has a failing into, well, see, yep, can't trust anybody. Proved it again. And you will find evidence, there's always evidence. We're humans, we fail at times, but one of our, the hopes is that you wouldn't be so hyper-focused on those points of evidence. You would have a generalized view of, a more complete view of it. Now, trying to bring that into a session, some people are more readily willing to hear it, right? We've all seen this. There's some people like, yes, yes, okay, I'm willing to learn, let's do this. And the others where the brain has gotten into such a position that it defends yes. it. Mm -hmm. It's like, no. There's a level of rigidity that even as you try to say, hey, maybe this is what's going on, you're like, nope, nope, I don't want to see it. I think that, that you just said something that I think is the insidious part of these weeds that are planted in the yes. field, these uh, toxic narratives, these contamination stories, that once they take hold, we naturally start to look for evidence that supports that toxic story. Yes. We might not like our toxic story, we might uh, groan and grumble about it and know that it's dangerous in our life, yes. but we're still almost autonomically looking for evidence that supports it because that's the thing that helped us to make sense of our life. Yes. And if we can't support that destructive narrative as the sense maker in our life, then where are we then? Exactly. And this, I think this is exactly where, to reframe this back into how Jesus uh, encountered and approached people, this is exactly where what he was doing with people. I think about... Peter. Uh, Peter had a schema mm -hmm. of, uh, I, I guess I would say, arrogance and overconfidence mm -hmm. that was a protective device for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. I think we can see that in his behavior. Mm -hmm. And it comes to that moment when he's in uh, by the fire and Jesus is inside being interrogated before the cross. And uh, Peter's decided to be there because he's the guy who said he would be there till the end. Mm -hmm. So he's outside at the fire. 
but he hears Jesus being beaten up mm-hmm. inside, mm-hmm. and uh, and in a kangaroo co- court situation inside, and he denies him three times, yep. and then leaves in shame. Yep. And I think it's not in scripture, but I think just knowing myself and human nature, somebody who had that schema going on, yep. who to a little girl denies he even knows him three times, yep. must have been absolutely devastating to yep. his identity. Yep. And we don't see him again until after the cross. Yep. What is he doing? Yep. I think he's somewhere in a dark hole wondering whether he should keep living or not. Mm. Because now his whole narrative about himself has been upended. Mm-hmm. And after the cross, he sees Jesus on the beach and that you know iconic scene where Jesus asks him, do you love me three times? Mm-hmm. What is Jesus doing? I think he's trying to surface He's trying to surface that destructive narrative. Yeah. And now he's trying to upend it. Yeah. Do you love me? Yes. And then Peter gets angry the yeah. last, the third time mm-hmm. because now it is surfaced. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. And yeah. I think he's what he's saying is, I trust you. To do the work. I trust you to do the work. Yep. Um, we're surfacing this weed, Peter, yeah. so that you can now yeah. go on. Yeah. I re-embrace you. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's how he's engaging people in yeah. this holistic way that you're talking yeah. about. And it's an art form. Yeah. I love how you just said that. It's a, a challenge because it's an art form. It's, yeah. it's, it's not a science because these are stories we're talking about. So I, I wonder if you could, let's, let's talk a little bit more about the biology and then let's move into, in closing, into the last part of the book, which is yeah. all about a menu of possibilities for the software side yeah. of all this. Yeah. So biologically... If somebody is is uh, looking for hope and needing hope, what could you say about the biological side of this that would offer them hope? So, so let me just connect a couple of things there. Um, what you said right there about Peter, by the way, I love that. I mean, I think we could probably spend more time talking about it <laughs> and really analyzing that. But um, that element of destructive narratives, we can see how challenging that is to attack. Yeah. Right. And and how you'd have to create a relationship with somebody, maybe a therapist or somebody that you're working with, and really do that deep dive to figure out what those narratives are. Could, could I say something yeah. there real quick? Because you said this before, and I think it's important. You said th- that that's really challenging, and it's because the destructive narrative is being defended. Yes. It, it's not, it, we know that, and maybe even the person knows, yeah. that this this could, healing in this could could really restore them. Yeah. Nevertheless, they, they defend their narrative. Yeah, so let me actually give you a better example of this. So there's another destructive uh, narrative or schema. Um, it's related to enmeshment, mm-hmm. all right? Enmeshment is uh, two people, um, usually it's parent-child, uh, it, it, forming a bond or a relationship that moves from healthy to unhealthy, right? Believing in some ways that um, a life separate from parent or child, um, they can't really ever be fully happy or sustain themselves away from each other. Okay, so there, it's a it's it's a strategy to maintain some level of safety. It's a strategy to maintain some level of connection, and in some ways, it has its protective benefits, especially maybe earlier on in life. They really bonded well. They probably have a better relationship initially with their parent, so they're going through those first few years of life. And for the most part, they're doing okay, but they'll hit a point where their own biology says, no, we can't do this. Hmm. We need to have individualism. We need to create our own sense of self. They will actually hit that point. And at that point, that might start to generate depression. Hmm. Then they will come see me and say, hey, I'm depressed. In the context of our work, we may see some things in the scan, maybe not, depending on what they're presenting with. Uh, we may start the treatment process, but over time you start to discover that relationship there. Because hmm. they get stuck in a particular position there. If they get well, right, it might mean that they have to separate. And they don't necessarily want to do that. Because my identity is caught up in my measurement. Relationship, exactly. And then if they stay together, they remain depressed, which is the reason they came in in the first place. So they feel that they're stuck in almost like a catch-22 situation. Their real solution is separate, go through that process of rediscovering and recreating self and such. Um, but that's the hike again, right? Yep. That's the hike again. Now let me take it back. Let me take this 
to hardware, okay? We just described that something like that can be challenging on so many levels, um, working through destructive narratives, and we talk about a whole lot more in here. Um, but imagine if your brain isn't working right too. That there's actually something going on brain-wise, biologically-wise, that impacts your ability to point to that destructive narrative, identify it, and then implement the necessary solutions. It's creating tremendous headwinds exactly. against your ability to move forward. Exactly. So you go into therapy and you say therapy doesn't work. You take a med and you say med doesn't work potentially, right? Because for different reasons. The med may not work because we're dealing with a psychological issue. The therapy may not work because you're not in a place to be able to, to see that schema and it's defended, right? So part of the work we do and part of even why we're, we're writing in it, this is to show people this possibility that not only do you need to target the narrative, which we'll sh talk about some more again and some solutions, but also we need to be, we always need to consider that biology. We mm -hmm. always need to consider that hardware. Are there elements hardware-wise that may impact why you're not getting well, Yeah. right? And those elements are, if we think about it, makes sense, but we don't always think about it. If you bump your head, if you have one concussion, your risk for depression goes up. If you have one concussion, your risk of suicide doubles or even triples, depending on the study you look at. Mm -hmm. Just one concussion. And we sometimes explain that away. Um, if people have other, other illnesses, if they've even had mold, Lyme, if they have genetic risks for depression or anxiety, that changes, literally changes how your brain works. And that's gonna impact those schemas, how hard it is to get at them. Hmm. So often, we have to actually help uh, the, the brain heal before we can even target the, the psychological you, elements you to, of it. You have to deal with the headwinds part of this yeah, exactly. in order for there to be a chance for the agency part yes. of this to kick in yes. because some of the biological issues are outside of our agency. They, yes. they need to be addressed first before that can kick in. And I was thinking about something you just said too about uh, if we go back to the parable of the weed in the weeds, mm -hmm. Jesus said an enemy, his, his worker said an enemy snuck in at night yeah. and planted these. And we know that Jesus' definition of that enemy is some is a, an entity mm -hmm. that intends to kill and steal and destroy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, uh, it, it sounds uh, very melodramatic when you listen to that mm -hmm. sort of purpose of that entity. But the real focus of that is the obliteration of our identity. Mm. That that death is one thing, but to have your identity obliterated, yeah. in a way, I think is 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 uh, worse than death. That's why death looks like a good option, I mm. think, for people who've had their identity obliterated, yeah. because it's it's intolerable to be in that place. Yeah. And we have an enemy who understands yeah. how intolerable that is, yeah. and is working toward that outcome. The good news is, is we have a good God. Yes who is for us yes. and fierce on our behalf. Yes. And he's the only restraint he's given himself is that it's by invitation. He will not force the solution on yes. us. He will only invite. So he has to have our participation in it. I think that's how, that's how one of the ways I read the, bi the biology hardware part of this. Mm -hmm. if, we're, if, if our hardware is keeping us from being, having agency, yes then we're, we're stuck for sure. Mm -hmm. We need the opportunity to have agency and respond to that invitation yes. in order to participate in the healing. So let's, let's say that, that, that those hardware issues are addressed to the level at which the software then becomes very important, the mm -hmm. software side of things. And mm -hmm. the last, I'd say, two-thirds of our book is is really a menu of possibilities mm -hmm. on the operating system side of things. Mm -hmm. So um, we have lots of things in there. It's yeah. Sometimes people think this is a to-do list. It's not. It's just if you go into a restaurant and there's a huge menu there, all it is is a list of possibilities. What do you like? What fits? Yeah. And uh, I know there's many things that I'm now practicing mm -hmm after having gone through writing this book with you that I wasn't practicing before because they fit on the menu into my life and I'm changing my life lifestyle to create greater whole health in myself, uh, build up my own brain reserve. What's something that either for you or 
um, maybe recently in some engagement with a with a with a client that would be in this software side that something that uh, a, a new habit a new a new way of living their life that would uh, help to develop a more healthy operating system for them. So actually, when I talk with my, my clients, um, as, as much as you know, they may come in with a, a problem that needs to be made sense of and a goal that they need to achieve, I usually uh, try to discuss their strengths too. So um, as we look at their scans or go through their history, uh, I'm finding the connection to what giftings, what talents they may have. Um, my, my clients who, who have the busier brains, I'm usually uh, connecting that to their creativity. Um, and how it may show up or manifest in, in their lives. Um, creativity, for one, is a spectacular outlet, right? It ends up being a software-based solution mm. that has hardware elements to it, uh, depending on what type of creative outlet you have. So I actually communicate something to my clients quite often, and I call it the four Cs. Um, it's in many ways in this book. It's broken up in this book. We've, we've, we talk about it in there. But one of the, the first things is you connect. Um, we're all social creatures. Even those of us who may be more introverts do need that quality connection. Um, we may tell ourselves we don't. We may tell ourselves we don't like people. Um, and they might be true valid reasons, but the tendency that it's, it's one of those catch-22 situations. You may not feel safe with people, but there's a part of you that knows and needs people. So the more you isolate, the more you actually perpetuate your depression, Yeah. Um, which then, again, keeps you in that loop. So connection, and it doesn't mean you're talking to somebody every day, and it doesn't mean you have to maintain unhealthy, unsafe relationships, but connection becomes a big component mm -hmm. of the four Cs, right? Um, creation. Mm -hmm. So I just started with that. So you connect, you create. Um, having that creative outlet, whether that's in music, whether that's in cooking, whether that's in dance, whatever it may be. If they already have it before they come in or they come into the session, I tell them, hey, this is why you've been drawn to it. Hmm. And it really is. There's a reason why people tend to get drawn into certain things, right? They like to draw, they like to paint, they like um, art, they, they, they like music or dance. Often it's because they've realized very early on it's part of their, in some ways, formula for keeping them well. You know, what's interesting is that in this time of the pandemic, yeah. when all of the these uh, statistics on suicide anxiety and suicidality and depression, all these uh, just ramped up. Yep. I mean, it, it's literally an epidemic on top of an epidemic. Yep. There was this explosion of creativity around uh, cooking and baking. And uh, it's because we, we couldn't go out. Yep. And so it, it kind of funneled into sort of a natural mental health strategy to start being creative around the food that you were making and it just exploded during yeah. the pandemic. So it, I just thought about that as you were talking about this, that people sort of naturally knew that this else. creative outlet would actually help them to have better holistic health. Yes, yes, um, that's, that's very true. The gardening, whatever it may have been, there's a lot of things. It's even probably even why um, I had some colleagues that got into making um, uh, TikTok videos and, <laughs> and things like that. And they've actually used it to benefit because they'll, they'll share particular messages and that, that does provide benefit to others. But it became in itself um, uh, an outlet, which then leads to contribution, actually. That's one of the other Cs, right? How do you support those in, in, around you? How do you support those in your community? Um, it, it's been said that sometimes if you're in a deep depression or deep anxiety, worried about a nervous breakdown, go find someone to help. That's another strategy beyond just go to therapy or, or take a medicine. I'm not saying that's for everybody, but it does become a potential other way to move from out a self-sent focus. Yeah, and the, the, I, think it's, I think it's the last chapter in the book says looking out instead of in. Yeah. And that, that, re that whole chapter is really about uh, a wide variety of ways to live out that ethic that you're talking about yep. right now. To, to start looking out more than you're looking in yeah. can help to rebalance some of these multiple factors that are feeding into that slide. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And, and it, which then relates back to the, the intentionality of it all. So I, I, the last one, the last C is, is cultivate personal wellness overall. Hmm. Right? It's, it's taking care of the garden overall. 
but being intentional about it. You don't default into better health. <laughs> you, you're, you're thinking about it. You're thoughtful about it. You assess where you are. You assess where your tendencies are. And then we even talk about something in the, in the book called an organizing principle. Yep. It's, it's something we'll, we'll spend time discussing in the book, but it really just comes down to your personal mission statement. So instead of always being focused on, oh, I have that schema. Oh, did I do it again? Uh, instead of having that focus, shifting you to a more proactive, positive focus of, I am an overcomer. I'm a survivor. This is actually... Um, uh, one of the stories we share in the book about a client of mine named Zane who taught me this is how important that is, right? To be able to proactively speak into yourself the identity you want, to meditate on that identity versus our tendency to meditate on, on our failings. Uh, um, oh, I messed up again. I did that again. Yep, they told me that in the book and, I'm, and I'm, I don't want people focusing on those things. I want them eventually to be able to move proactively, intentionally into, this is the person I want to be. How am I doing on that? And we have an artist, Jesus, who's a storyteller, because God, by his very nature, is a storyteller. Yep. Uh, the artist, Jesus, who's trying to thread a redemptive narrative into our story. And that, that moment where he starts to speak a story that's like a plot to our life. Mm -hmm. The, I, I see that that organizing uh, principle as the plot line yep. that we follow in our life. And if we're following a plot line that ends with our own death, yep. because that the plot makes sense, what Jesus is trying to do is introduce a different plot yep. where the end of the story isn't our own destruction, it's our own rescue, our yep. own redemption, yep. because that's the true story. Yep. It's funny that uh, every movie we love has a redemptive storyline in it mm -hmm. because there's something embedded in our soul that says that's the truest story we can experience as yeah. human beings is a yeah. redemptive storyline that was uh, uh, purposefully planted in yeah. us as human beings to guide us toward the truth yeah. that that he's trying to tell a redemptive story in our lives i um i, I maybe we could close off by talking about how um this this whole mission that that we're on in this book mm -hmm. is is to bring about that word in people's lives a redemptive storyline that replaces the destructive contaminated storyline that they're living by and that that redemption is more than what we typically talk about in the church as you know sort of your ticket ticket to heaven or whatever that is yeah. redemption is holistic yep. jesus wants to restore us into the wholeness yes. of our identity and you can see that in the way that he interacts with person after person he's always trying to restore the dignity of their identity yep. i think about that uh, story of the uh, the man that he smeared mud on his eyes to so Jesus could have touched him mm -hmm. and cured his blindness, yeah. but instead he spits in the dirt, spreads mud on his eyes, and says, now go walk outside of town to the Pool of Siloam. Find your way there somehow yep. with mud over your eyes, still blind. Yeah. Wash there, and then you'll, you'll be able to see. Why does he do that? Yeah. I think it's because he's trying to capture the man's dignity again as well. He's saying... Participate with me. Yes. I'll do some. Yes. You do some. Yes. Let's participate together and restore your dignity, not just your sight, mm -hmm. that now you've participated in this healing. And I think for me, that's what this book really is about. It's the merger of wholeness. You know, that I, I love that story because there is agency in it, but there's humility in it also. Mm -hmm. um, I actually see that often in either my clients or, or faith, sometimes they can struggle to accept a treatment plan at times because they will see it as, does it mean I didn't have enough faith that I have to take this supplement, take this vitamin, go to that therapist or whatever? And it's interesting that we can't always tell God how we want our healing to be. <laughs> if it ends up being a piece of mud in your eye and that's how he wants to heal you, then you accept and move forward. Um, that's one of my hopes from this book, that people start to see that God may heal you in a way that you might not have initially hoped for or planned for, and it's not generally a reflection of your faith. 
it's just the nature of your biology potentially or other work that may need to be done in your heart. The, the other piece of it is the agency. I also see this in my clients too. The, the clients that come in with agency and they're saying that invitational element, we're working together, we're collaborating together to come to, this deci- to our decisions, they tend to do better. They tend to have longer lasting benefit. So it's not just what I say or what I tell them and what to do next. They might even go and do a little extra research and a little something, something, and send it back to me and be like, whoa, that's nice. I like that. I learned from you. Um, there's the intentionality of wellness. Now, if you're in a space where you're so down, depressed, anxious, whatever, don't compare yourself to that. That's not the point. The point is that being able to take that agency, being able to recognize that there's an intentionality in this, there's a little bit of a hike. Um, it might sometimes be a lot of bit of a hike, depending on where you're starting from, but being able to take those first steps. Your first day of victory is that first step forward, right? Your next day is the next step. Even if you take a step back, you take another step forward. Um, that becomes a huge element of what we're trying to communicate in this book. Yeah, and the contamination stories that we have in us are telling us there is no hope. Mm-hmm. That's essentially their end message. Yep. If you follow, track them down, the, the end message is there's no hope. Yeah. And, the, and Jesus is saying there's always hope. Yeah. There's hope in me. Yeah. In me. I thought uh, we could close off. I'm just going to read the last paragraph of our introduction here mm-hmm. that kind of sets up what you and I have hoped to do mm-hmm. here. This book is the fruit of an ongoing conversation between a theologian and ministry practitioner and a psychiatric therapist and researcher. Along the way, We'll fold in the voices of those who are struggling to find their way out of the valley of the shadow of death Mm -hmm. and have discovered the guiding hand of Jesus pulling them to safety. Drawing from the transformational whole person strategies of Jesus and informed by a deep perspective on the clinical realities of anxiety, depression, and suicide, we'll chart a path into life and freedom. The goal is to help ourselves and others embrace a narrative of life instead of death. I think that's what it's all about. Yep. Yep. By the way, <laughs> this book is available everywhere. Uh, bookstores, online, Amazon. It's a, uh, as you can tell from our conversation, it's a book threaded through with uh, faith in God. Yes. And, and clinical experience and research and uh, all these threads together. So it's it's available in, in every kind of bookstore, but... I actually don't know what section of the store it's going to be <laughs> shelved in because of these various elements. Yeah, um, no, I, I've actually verified. You can pretty much find it anywhere online at this point. So <laughs> there you have it. <laughs>